this week about a different type of letter story, though, uh, also kind of on the emotional connect to um, the fact that this is an epistle, a letter that we're studying and, and reading and preaching through this winter. And I thought about the idea of letters lost in the mail that arrive much later. And I was thinking, is that just something you hear about in movies or in stories, or does it ever actually happen? Well, it does, and I found a few uh, pretty interesting examples. One, it's a 130 eight-year delay, and in 2015, a French woman in her 80s received a letter that had been intended for her great-great, uh, for her great-grandfather, and the letter arrived at the home of a woman named Therese 138 years after it had been mailed in 1877, and it was only mailed from a mere six miles away, and the topic in the letter was, uh, it was an order for a ball of yarn from her great-grandfather's spinning mill. Another story of 83-year delay and uh, a woman, a uh, letter postmarked in Montgomery, Alabama that was originally mailed in 1944 to an American Red Cross station a hospital in California went AWOL until 2011. And the return address, or the address was slightly damaged, so they weren't really sure um, where it was meant to be sent to. And so it ended up being displayed in an archives display somewhere, and the daughter of the woman it was written to recognize it, was able to verify the identity of the original receiver, and the letter was finally delivered in 2011. Another example of uh, a town in Paris that uh, the government uh, in the city of Paris sent a letter to a town, but it was sent to the wrong town with just slightly different spelling in the name, which I'm not going to try to pronounce in my bad French. But it arrived 220 years later to the original town. And the last one's a little bit more emotional. A birthday card was sent to a Brooklyn address. Now, that's the other Brooklyn. You may have heard of it. It's Brooklyn with an I. But a letter was sent by a caring mother to mark her daughter's 19th birthday. And it arrived 45 years late uh, with a lipstick seal of a kiss on the back, a six-cent stamp. It had been mailed by her late mother in 1969. And so understandably, in that case, it drew a flood of tears from Susan Leafheights when she finally received this letter from her mother in 2014. I saved that last story uh, to the end of my uh, examples because it's relevant to a question I want you to think about. You know, last week I mentioned the concept of salvation tense, past and present, and I gave you homework just like your kids' online teachers did last week. And your homework was to go back on the passage we've been looking at, basically verses 1 to 9, and look for the different tenses used to describe salvation. Most of them, or all of them in that passage, were the present salvation they were experiencing now and the glorious hope. Remember, we talked about that inheritance in the future, something imperishable, undefiled, kept in heaven for you. Well, when we start off this morning, we're going to kind of go a little bit in reverse. We're going to go back in the past. We're going to find out exactly how deeply rooted the gospel message is in the past. So I've got a kind of a question for you about these first verses, 10 to 12, and it's the question is this. If the gospel, if the good news like 1 Peter um, could be compared to a precious letter with a return address of Jesus, like we said last week, when was that letter mailed to you? Then I want to consider what difference it makes to people facing various trials and griefs and difficulties, even while they are being shielded by God's power. It does make a big difference if you really think about it, and I, and I want you to do that right now. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reread just the opening here from our epistle, reminding us that this was a letter written by Peter with a return address of Jesus sent to, well, you'll hear it. To God's elect, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God. There's that past part. Um, the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit 
to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Then let's skip all the way down to verse 10. Last week we looked at verses 3 to 9 primarily. Verse 10, concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you, by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, even angels long to look into these things. We can be pretty self-absorbed uh, in, our, in our faith perspectives. And what I mean by that is we, we can forget that our salvation story, sometimes we call that our testimony, is, is part of a very, very old, very large salvation story. And has been witnessed by a great cloud of witnesses. Uh, I could take my own personal example. The way I remember my own kind of coming to faith in Christ is uh, pieced together with some spotty childhood memories. I, I remember my older brother, who's four years older than me. Uh, he made a faith commitment at one point, and I uh, remember that being a really big deal to my parents. And, and I also started to have this awareness that, oh, like there's, there's something that needs to be done that, that I've not done. Uh, my next childhood memory is being at some father-son meeting of some type at my church, and uh, there was an evangelistic speaker giving an invitation to come and pray a prayer of salvation. And I, and I remember I managed to avoid caving into the pressure. But later on, I remember my mom talking to me about it and leading me to uh, a prayer of salvation. So according to my own perspective, it all started sometime around 1973 or 74, but First Peter, uh, First Peter one to nine that we looked at last week, well, that might give me all kinds of hope about the the things that became real for me that time in in, in that time and place, versus uh, and and when that salvation message found me, these things now were true about me. We looked at that last week, but verses ten to twelve add another layer. That message that reached me, so to speak, and reached others, um, that was sent many centuries earlier by the ancient prophets, people like Moses and Isaiah and others. They proclaimed God's word back then to their people, but our passage told us, but the Spirit revealed to them there was more going on than just what they were saying. And they, and they, they would have loved to have known how this was all going to work out, how this was ever going to reach those that had not been born, let alone not been even born again. On top of that, God sent preachers through all of the generations to people like you and me, if we have a relationship with Christ in, in this day. So if any of us have opened this letter of the good news, uh, 1 Peter 1, 10 to 12 reminds us that letter was mailed a long time long time ago. Um, God's been working out my salvation all along. And, and by the way, that's why we call it salvation, because I can't really take claim credit for it. Even angels, our passage tells us, longed to be able to see how this was ever going to be delivered and how it would reach to you and me. Well, what difference does that make? Remember, our letter is written to people that are suffering. They're, they're experiencing all kinds of trials and hardship, even though they're being shielded by God's power. So what difference does it make that this letter was mailed centuries ago? Delayed gratification is difficult. I know that's a psychological term, you know, really from just in the last 100 years or so, 150 years of history. But people in Peter's day were suffering, and they were longing for that inheritance that was promised in the future. They were suffering grief and all kinds of trials, and when they wondered, how long, Lord, until you return and set all things right and bring this new kingdom fully that you've promised? 
Well, they were being called to patience. Well, it might seem to me like salvation uh, arrived in my life in a three-year time span 50 years ago. The truth is, it was on its way since before the foundation of the world. It found me eventually. I, I can be confident if it found me eventually, it will safely take me home. I, I might not understand the logic, but I can understand the logistics that God works out His salvation on His time. Which leads us to the word therefore in our passage, and, and it's one of the Bible's great therefores. There, there are a lot of big therefores in the Bible. Most of them are in the Apostle Paul's letters, and you know, he goes on in the beginning of his letters with all of this theology and doctrine and these exalting visions, like the hymn we sang this morning, Be Thou My Vision. That's the kind of things that Paul writes. And then, boom, here's what we ought to do about it. And uh, that's really important to watch for in your Bible reading because sometimes we rush right into the ought to's and we just look at them and focus and we see this command that says we should do something and we run off trying to do it and we haven't really thought about the why we should do it. And that's in the before the therefore. We've been looking at that so far. Otherwise, some people tend to just look at all of the ideas and they get all lost in the doctrine and the theology and they never really get to the ought to. It's almost like knowledge for knowledge's sake, and that's never really a high value in the Bible. So we want to do both, so we're moving on to the therefore this morning, and let me start reading, and I'll read the rest of our passage for this morning. This is 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at His coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. There's a popular uh, romantic drama a few years ago uh, that had the title Hope Floats. I'm not sure exactly what the meaning of that title was. I, I would say Peter is saying, not only does hope float, hope really matters. Um, one of the many influential academics to come out of the horrors of the Holocaust experience, uh, one of the most famous was the psychologist, neurologist, and uh, even considered a great philosopher, Viktor Frankl. And one of his most quoted works is his uh, major best-selling book called the Cert- Man's Search for Meaning. And in that little book, Man's Search for Meaning, you find the often told story that he tells of a gifted musician and fellow prisoner um, in the concentration camp with Frankl who, who had a vivid dream. And in this vivid dream, he heard this powerful voice, and the person in the voice told him that he, he wanted him to make one wish, but it must be one thing that he wanted to know. And the man responded as he told this story to Victor that he wanted to know when the war would be over for him. He wanted to know when he would be liberated. And he claimed that the voice answered March 30th. And Victor Frankl says that he was full of hope. But as the day approached, it became, it appeared obvious that there was no end in sight to the war on March 30th. 
Uh, and, and there was no end of sight on March 29th when he became suddenly ill, which was likely with typhus. And on March 30th, he lost consciousness. And on March 31st, he was dead. And Frankel writes, to, however, uh, he writes, he says, to all outward appearances, he died of typhus. However, to those of us who know how close the connection is between the state of mind of a man and the state of immunity of his body, we'll understand that the sudden loss of hope can have a deadly effect. Any attempt to restore a man's inner strength has first to succeed in showing him some future goal. Peter would say, yes, hope matters. It matters incredibly to human beings. But, but he would say, not only does hope matter, he would say, be careful where you set it. Be careful where you set your hope. Because it is so important. Now, Peter's painted an amazing vision of the present and future glory um, of God's salvation. And, and, he, and I've even talked about its long distance delivery, that we can be so encouraged that it's taken centuries for it to arrive to us when it finally did. And we, we can know that it will take us safely home. And we can know that in the present, we, we can wade out these difficult circumstances because God's shown his ability to do what he says he's going to do, even when it takes a long time. But Peter gives us the advice, be careful where you set your hope. He says, set your hope fully, put all of it. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you. Look at these three verses. Verse, verse 3 in, in 1 Peter says, Praise be to the Lord and God, to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Then down in verse uh, 13, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at His coming. Down in verse 21, Through Him you believe in God who raised Him from the dead and glorified Him, and so your faith and hope are in God. I thought this week about how doctors are often very careful, if any of us have ever been with a loved one and they're in a very serious um, situation, a very serious health situation, doctors are really hesitant to give false hope. You've probably had that experience where they don't, they don't want to say exactly what you want to hear them say. If they're really not sure they can come through, they, they don't want to hand out false hope. But I, but I wondered this week, I wonder if once in a while, how strong that temptation must be for them to just throw out words of hope, because in a Victor Frankl kind of way, maybe, maybe just having some hope is going to be good for the patient, and will kind of help them survive longer or survive longer in, the, in their condition with a little less pain, kind of a temporary pain reliever. But Peter doesn't tell us to just cross our fingers and hope for the best as a temporary pain reliever. He tells us to place our hope firmly in Christ as an eternal hope. Put your whole mind into it, he says in verse 13. It sounds like a conscious act. And in fact, a healthy mind is one of the marks of people with well-placed hope. We've got two signs here in, in verses 15 um, of someone with well-placed hope. They have a prepared, sober mind, and they display holy living. In verse 15, well, that prepared, sober mind is literally gird up your minds. Well, that's a foreign idea, uh, pretty much lost on us, even when it gets translated into English, gird up your mind. Gird up the loins of your mind is how it actually is, is written. The only, the only loins ever, anyone at Renaissance ever girds lately is probably their toddlers at home. But this whole idea of gird up your loins, it's meant to give you a picture of a soldier or an athlete back in the day when flowing robes were the uh, standard issue clothing. And if you were getting ready to either run or to fight, you would, you would grab the hem of your garment and hike it up and tuck it into your belt and you would gird up your loins. You don't even want to know what the wrestling uniform was. You can look that up later. So what does it mean to gird up your mind? Well, I think it means have it ready, discipline it, train it, 
prepare it. An odd thought came to me just yesterday. How many Christians spend more time training their glutes than their minds? Religiously doing squats for one and yet doing squat for the other. (laughs) If you remember our old sermon series that you become what you worship, well, wait for it. You'll understand what I mean. So a second distinguishing mark, though, beyond this girding up, preparing, setting your mind, mentally placing your hope on Christ with your mind. The second distinguished mark is is holy living. Look at verse 14. Do not conform, or some translations say, do not be conformed to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. Well, there's a snapshot of all those changes that Peter's been talking about all the way up to this point. Uh, Before the long-distance letter of the gospel reached them, they didn't know any better. And their lives at that time were just displaying the fruit of their mental darkness. But now you're called to be holy. He says, holy in all your conduct. In all your conduct. In a conversation with a friend this week, I was reminded of, uh, I was reminded and then really actually somewhat haunted by an outline that he had once heard preached by a well-known pastor from the historic Moody Bible Church, our own Canadian treasure, Erwin Lutzer. And he preached this outline that my friend Steve reminded me of about sowing and reaping. And the outline went like this. We, we reap what we sow. We reap more than we sow. And we reap in a different season than we sow. I want you to write those down and think about them later. Because they're both at the same time incredibly encouraging and exciting. And they're incredibly frightening. Because it all depends on the kind of seed you're sowing, right? This idea of sowing, uh, reaping far more than we sow, that's that's an amazing possibility of, of our sacrifices of righteousness and praise. But the idea of reaping far more than we sow in the other direction, not so great. The idea that we will reap at a much later season than we sow, that helps us endure and keep on doing the right thing. But the idea of reaping what we sow in the other direction, pretty frightening. Uh, I teased a friend this week about how the most famous graduate of my Bible college placed number one in the biggest stories of 2020 from the religious journalist Julie Roy's countdown, while the most famous graduate of his was only number six. But the sad part of my jab was that these were the 10 biggest disaster stories of 2020. So think long and hard with that redeemed mind of yours as to what kind of seed you're sowing. There's a lot more motivation here in our passage for holy living. There's three big motivations in our passage in verses 15 to 19, and they're God's character, God's judgment, and Christ's sacrifice. Well, God's character, how does that come in? In verses 15 and 16, Peter quotes from a famous Old Testament passage from Leviticus, uh, um, you know, be holy as He is holy. You need to always be careful how you use that kind of principle in that passage. It's been misused uh, by various sects and generations of the Christian community, often to justify socially legalistic actions and ways of dress and ways of kind of comparing yourself to all the other people that aren't as holy as you because of the things that you're doing. And, And that's completely off track, I think, of the original intent. You know, the the behaviors and the style of dress and all of this kind of stuff, they become the defining marks of what holiness really is. And anybody that doesn't conform to that is therefore not holy. But this passage tells us that the onus on applying the passage is knowing which measure is the standard that determines or defines holy living. It's the actual holy character of God that determines human behavior rather than the human behavior defining or somehow creating holiness. The things that you do, I would say, are kind of like what the moon is to the sun. You know, the moon is really just a mere reflection of something far greater. The moon doesn't generate its own light. 
It just reflects the light of the sun. And Peter's writing to exiles, and remember, they're being called. They're being called by this greater than themselves, a holy God, and they are to reflect His holiness to the world around them. It reflect the source of all the changes that we've been talking about. The second motivation is, is God's judgment. Considering that God's perfect, and this is in verse 17, considering God's perfect in all He is and all He does, He's also perfect in His judgment. It must be incredibly difficult for a, a human judge in an actual role as a judge in a court of law. It must be incredibly difficult, and they must really have to discipline their minds in order to be impartial in their judgments. Uh, we know that every once in a while, uh, an unjust judge or a corrupt judge, it gets outed because they've been partial. There's been something making them partial in their judgments, and they haven't been judging in a way that's justly. And that often makes a lot of news, and we all cry foul. But we should probably be shocked. We should probably applaud far more when any human being is able to make any judgment that's completely impartial. God is not one of those imperfect judges. God is perfectly impartial. He's described here as our heavenly father. You may have had an earthly father who had favorites. You might have been wounded in either way, deformed through your childhood because you were not the one who was favored, or there are also many examples of where you were deformed in your childhood because you were the one that was favored. Your heavenly Father is not one of those fathers. So if your father, your actual earthly father, if your father was somehow miraculously, perfectly impartial in his parenting and his, his leadership over you and your family, if he was completely impartial, you would probably treat your siblings pretty carefully while he wasn't around. So Peter says to these people in exile, while they're in exile, don't use their suffering and the delayed gratification and this gap between the promises that are given to them and their, the experience of it now and the here and now. Don't use any of that as an excuse for sin. Because God has good reasons, He's already told us, behind our trials. We're going to find out more about that in future sermons. He has good reasons for them. We talked last week about refining and the, and the refining of our, of our lives and our souls. And if God has good reason for our trials, we can be pretty sure of this. You know, sometimes we say, well, I don't even know. I don't know what the reason is for why I'm going through this. Mm, we know one reason it's not. And that's to enable us to go back to our patterns of sin and the things that we did before God intercepted us with this long lost letter of the gospel that finally made it to us. We can know that for sure. Um, we need to set our minds prepared, thinking about where our hope is, and then living in a reflection as a people that have their hope in God alone. He won't justify sin by our excuses. The third one's the real big piece of this puzzle, and that's Christ's sacrifice in verses 18 and 19 and down to the end of the passage. You don't have to be, uh, you don't have to be a genius or all that much of a great observer of world culture to know that the world is pursuing hope elsewhere other than in God or in the gospel message. I mean, there are training programs, there are celebrity biographies, there are seminars, how-to books, training programs with advanced degrees on how to achieve these other hopes and dreams in your life. The precious gold and silver of the values of the world that we live in, a world that is in darkness, and we once were in that darkness. Well, Peter's kind of reminding us not only were we saved from that darkness, we also weren't saved by the silver and gold that the world values so much. Let's, let's just reread these verses. 
For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed. I'm going to come back to that word redeemed. From the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, he was chosen before the creation of the world. I want to think about those two verses. I want to think about... um, the whole idea that, um, I, I, I thought this week about this whole idea that this redemption and the price that God paid in Christ for our redemption, and where we usually run off with that far too quickly, and, and I know I'm guilty of this myself, is to run off with this idea, see how valuable you are, because God paid so much, God was willing to pay so much for you, that this is how valuable you are. You might be able to get there on some other passage in, in, a, in a secondary way, but I don't think that's what Peter's after here. I mean, at the time, it sounds really inspiring, and who doesn't love to hear that? Um, but I thought about this idea of redemption and how it's used in this passage and, and how we were redeemed and what we were redeemed with. There are some transactions that we make in the world where we take a useless little piece of paper, a coupon, And we redeem that coupon for something that we want or a discount off on something that we want. When Janine and I were young marrieds uh, living in a roach hotel of an apartment in our early years, I remembered a day when we went to the Boxing Day sale at the local Ikea just down the road from where we lived. We were there because in the newspaper there was an ad that they had this incredibly great price on those iconic 1980s and 90s Ikea chairs with the leather and the bent wood and all of that kind of stuff. And, and uh, since at this point, we did not own a single comfortable chair, we thought this is our chance. We're going to go down. There's a limited number, 150 or something like that. Chairs are available to the first people that arrive at the sale. So we headed on down the road to the sale to go buy our one chair. When we got there, the line was already pretty long. And it was really, really bitterly cold outside. So we parked our car. We went out in line. And, you know, we're trying to figure if we're far enough up in line. And then suddenly, because it was so bitterly cold out there, they got nervous in the store. And somebody came out handing out quickly run-off coupons. And they were handing one of these coupons to every single person in the line that was there in order to get this deal on this chair. So as this person got closer, we started thinking, oh, we're going to get a coupon and be able to go sit back in our car. And in the hype of it, we realized, wait, we could get two coupons because they're giving one to every person. And before you knew it, we had two coupons. And for 20 minutes, we sat in our car. And that little scrap piece of paper seemed so valuable. But when I thought about it, Ikea never gave us two chairs for a runoff little piece of paper. No, they exchanged that for cash. And Janine and I, in our case, it was only cash and probably credit card for the second chair because we were blowing our budget because we got caught up so much in the hype of something that we wanted. But we were willing to make the sacrifice because we wanted that thing so much. It was worth it. We can ramp up another idea of redemption. and We can just think about our homes and our houses. You know, really, in the village of Brooklyn here, like the major banks own more houses than any people do. But we will sign up for a long time and piles of piles of cash that we will give in order to redeem this thing that we want and we value so much. Even if we do the math and we realize, wow, this is really expensive, But we say to ourselves, no, you know what? For us, it's worth it. So we're going to do that. And then people say, well, houses, what are they really worth? They're worth what somebody's willing to pay for them. And we too quickly run off with that and we apply it to salvation. But I don't think that's what Peter's saying here because there's another part of the equation. You see, the price that was paid for our redemption is way overspending just compared to our own personal worth. Since it seems to be Ikea's 
advertising Sunday at Renaissance, I thought of another example, and that's our, our all-time favorite uh, Ikea commercial. It's one of our all-time favorite commercials, you know, when the woman gets the big steal at the, and she's running to her car with the bag saying, start the car, start the car. We, we use that expression in my family. Anytime anybody finds a great deal, we say, start the car. Because the woman in the commercial thinks she's getting away with the steal. She has, she's been given way more than was worth than, than what she paid. And she wants to get in her car and get out of there before somebody in the store figures out what she got away with. Our redemption is not that. What God paid is so much more than than, than what we were worth. If we applied the salvation message to that commercial... That woman would be running with the bags of everything that she had to her person. And she wouldn't be saying, start the car, start the car. She'd be saying, start the band, start the worship service. I I can't believe what God was willing to pay to save me out of bondage. And that, that bondage is that big missing piece of the puzzle. The price was so great because our problem was so great. God paid such an incredibly high price because of the depth and the couldn't do anything about it size of our problem. That's, that's why this passage about a lamb sprinkled in the, in the comparison of Christ's blood goes back to the Passover. And it's, it's applying that great story that we've talked about a number of times lately here at Renaissance where all of the children of Israel were told on the night they were going to finally be brought out of the bondage of slavery in Egypt. They were to hunker down in their homes in a lockdown and they were to spread the blood of an unblemished lamb on the doorposts of their home and then through the night they were to be ready to be rescued, eat that lamb. That gets done every year, every year in the great festival called Passover when God's judgment passed over their homes and they were brought out. Well, Peter's saying, your redemption, every single one of you, all of you, is based on the blood of the one perfect precious lamb. That that is what was paid for your salvation. So let me go back to this idea. How is this a motivation? Remember how we got here. We were looking for the motivation for holy living, and we, we thought about God's character, and we, we are to reflect our new family identity. We're to look like His people while we live among other people in exile. Some great day in the future is going to come where doing the right thing is only going to make us look like everybody else around us. This is not that day yet. Secondly, it was God's impartial judgment of actions. We, we may be safe from uh, damnation, but we'll still be disciplined fairly by a perfect heavenly Father. But lastly, in this idea of Christ's great sacrifice, we, we need to regularly ask ourselves, is this attitude that I'm considering right now or harboring or holding on to, is that what God had in mind when He paid that price for my sin? Is the freedom that I might believe I have to engage in this or that, is that the purpose of what that great price was intended for? The real problem was our debt. It was far greater than anything we could ever pay. God paid that to set us free, to set us free for holiness and reflecting His greatness and character to the world around us, enabling us to do that, even if only in our own limited way, more and more as we're changed to be more like His likeness. He not only sent His Son, Peter reminded us, He spent His Son. That worship, when I had my little picture of my Ikea woman saying, start the band, it's so much more than, than, than this should have you showing up at church on a Sunday morning in order to worship because of what... No, it's like your entire life should be in those bags as we run with them knowing that this price that was paid for our freedom is so much more than we could ever claim as being a fair deal. How long will Peter's readers suffer and still consider it all worthwhile in the end. I think it was going to depend on where 
they placed their hope. Where have you placed yours? Have you lost it? If you have, go back and find it. Re pause, place, replace it, replace your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. Maybe a lockdown's a perfect time to recalibrate your hope. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will make us people of uh, gratitude, that the motivation for holy living um, would be so based and firmly planted on the rock-solid sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ. Um, Forgive us for thinking that there's so much more that we might need in order to worship you. And I pray that you would enable us to do it with all of our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.